Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Financial Services Conference, um, our digital edition, uh, Regenerations Reimagined. Um, wherever you beaming in from and whichever platform you're on, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. This is the third uh, week of seven where we'll be delivering uh, some fantastic content and we've already been and had a, a lot of treats over the last couple of weeks, really thought-provoking, really interesting uh, and really well-curated content. Uh, so today's no different in for a really good, great discussion on uh, the role of codes, professional codes and how they drive uh, and impact organisations, consumer outcomes and so on. I um, wanted to uh, pay tribute and uh, thank and acknowledge uh, our sponsors uh, right across uh, right across uh, the market um, and uh, that previous slide had all of our uh, sponsors for all of our sessions and a huge thank you uh, to all of you. And this particular session, a huge thank you and shout out to our friends at BoardPro. Uh, we hear a little later uh, from Sean uh, at, towards the end of the uh, conversation. It's my really great pleasure now to uh, welcome uh, our panel um, and um, you can see on us on uh, on this slide uh, the panelists will go to them in a moment I'm not going to introduce them because I because we've agreed they'll actually introduce themselves um, and probably not only introduce themselves but actually answer the question from their perspective uh, as the first question what is the role of professional codes in helping to drive uh, corporate culture uh, governance and in particular great consumer outcomes so to Amy to Jeff uh, to Angus, uh, to Graham, uh, to Heidi, a very warm welcome and thanks for joining. And um, uh, Amy, I thought I'd uh, start with you if I can. Uh, you sit as uh, not only a, a key role inside AIA, but you're also the co-chair of the FSC's Code Governance Committee. So thanks, welcome and question one over to you. Yeah, I'm Amy Cunningham and I'm the Head of Conduct and Culture at AIA and as Richard mentioned, also the Chair of the FSC's Code Governance Committee, so very relevant to today's discussion of course. Um, my role at AIA is all about championing good conduct and that goes all the way from awareness and education right through to ensuring the right processes are in place. Um, and I'm also responsible for the operation of our internal um, code of conduct framework, uh, as well as the continued implementation, of course, of the FSC code of conduct. As Kofi lands, of course, I'll be um, leading AIA through the preparations for our new conduct licensing regime. So why are codes so important? Um, simply put, in my view, it's the fact that they underpin a company's culture they tell a story about what an organisation actually believes in and what it stands for. Um, it, it also is a bit of accountability in terms of how it can be expected to act by the public. Um, they not only serve as internal guidelines for our employees and our people, of course, but they very crucially are an external statement of your business's values and its purpose uh, from there, a customer can decide whether or not they want to do business with you, whether or not they trust you. Um, and I think that's why a good code of conduct can be so instrumental in driving that customer change and consumer change. Um, through codes, we can directly improve customer outcomes. And that could be from anything from that general commitment to always prioritise customers' interests or by encouraging the speak up culture that's so important within organisations um, to ensure that any conduct that falls short of those expectations are called out. Amy, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, folks, um, if you are dialing in and you want to participate in the conversation, uh, both on the Attendify and on the Zoom platform, there's a QA and a and chat button, feel free to ask away. The panel is uh, eagerly uh, keen to follow the train of thought around the audience. So, yeah, feel free to participate in the conversation. Jeff, I might go to you next if I can. Uh, you have many roles uh, in this world, but in terms of the FSC, you have been our uh, inaugural and current uh, chair of our code disciplinary committee, as well as being a practicing barrister. What's your take on this topic? Kia ora tato, katoa, uh, Richard. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, 
the 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 core, I think, uh, to professional or business codes of conduct is the notion of of values. Um, and I think Amy's touched on that uh, already. I think it's exceptionally important to bear in mind that um, codes are not so much about what you do, but how you do it. Um, and, and if you look at codes of conduct uh, worldwide, they have at their heart some basic ethical principles um, Things like honesty, trustworthiness, loyalty, respect for others, adherence to the law, of course, but not just uh, slavish or minimal adherence, adherence to the law, uh, doing good and avoiding harm, and accountability. All of those are core values that you see in codes of conduct whether they relate to business organizations, professions, uh, sports, uh, they are part and parcel of mapping out what you expect uh, in terms of the how you do things uh, and not just what you do. I look at uh, the FSC code um, that I've uh, been working on with uh, the FSC team on for the last couple of years. Um, as touching upon and providing benefits to potentially five constituencies. And each of those is just as important uh, as the other. And I just wanted to run through uh, each of them uh, and touch on them very briefly. First of all, there, there is a very important public-facing element of this, so the public at large is a constituency for the organization and its members. Uh, and the code is intended to build public confidence in the trustworthiness of uh, the organization, the sector, the industry, and its members. So that's the first constituency to bear in mind. Secondly, each one of the members of the organization has clients. Um, and, and the existence of the code, I think, is an exceptionally important step in providing greater transparency and greater certainty as to how their affairs will be dealt with uh, by organisations within the FSC. So that's the second important constituency of the five. The third, you have the member organisations themselves. And as Amy's touched on, uh, the code is a supporting framework that provides minimum standards and is an important buttress to resisting pressure externally and internally uh, to inappropriate action. The fourth group is, I'll call it the profession as a whole, the industry as a whole. Um, it provides a common basis. The code is a common basis common understandings of acceptable practice. And lastly, you've got others who are dealing with uh, organisations with uh, within the FESC. The existence of the code is a series of statements, a series of assertions that allows the organisation and its constituent members to be seen as more reliable, uh, more trustworthy uh, and easier to deal with. So from my perspective, Richard, uh, a values-based expression of intent as to how you'll go about doing your business with benefits to at least those five different identifiable constituencies. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Angus, I might go to you next um, because you've, you've kind of led the industry uh, through the old financial advisor code into the new world and likely have had to grapple with a lot of these things in a very practical way. Uh, t tell us a bit about you and, and your story and your take on this particular topic. Thank you, Richard, and Tenakota Katoa. Um, so I'm chair of the Financial Advice Code Committee. Um, it's a group of, uh, well, it was nine people. It's a slightly reduced in size now. And uh, as Richard said, we helped write the new version of the code for financial advisors. And it has an interesting story to it because it's not 
a professional code by itself. It's actually a code empowered by the legislation. And to understand how it got there, you have to rewind to 2007 when the Financial Advisors Act was being developed and the whole plan of government then was to empower the financial advice industry to set its own professional code. And it was in the absence of agreement across the advice industry that government then changed the legislation to say, yes, the legislation is going to drive the code itself. And I think that tells two really important stories for what we're discussing this afternoon. The first is that when you're calling yourself a profession or when you want to portray any set of values externally, you, you have to decide how you want to behave. And it's reasonable for other people to expect, whether it's government or other stakeholders, to expect that you show that in some way. And uh, a code is a mechanism for doing that. So a, a code sort of operates at a couple of levels. At, at one level, it's talking about the what, and as Jeff said, it's also talking about the how. And indeed, that's what the financial advice code does. But the second message, I think, that comes from the history we've got with the financial advice code is codes don't mean anything unless you're held to account over them. So it's no point just saying, hey, I believe in a code and then get away with behaving in a way that's not consistent with the code. And the whole reason for the financial advice code now sitting in the legislation is for the legislation to, in effect, give it a, an enforceability envelope around it so that if advisors don't follow the code, there's a consequence for them. So it's both those things, the need for a profession um, to, to have something to say, this is what we do, and um, being held to account over it. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Angus. And, yeah, look, we'll get into that uh, uh, codes need to have teeth conversation um, a little later in the discussion. Heidi, um, I'll go to you next. Um, within the FSC code journey, you've really been there from the outset and seen us kind of really grapple with a lot of these big questions. Tell us a bit about you and, yeah, your take on, uh, on, on this topic. Awesome. Thanks, Richard, and thank you for having me here on the panel. Um, so I'm Heidi Stroud. I've worked with financial services organisations and particularly the Financial Services Council for about five years now um, over a range of different activities. Um, one of the highlights for me has been supporting the FSC membership through the creation of the FSC Code of Conduct. So, yep, I'm here today to help share my insights and learnings from that journey. Um, I was there, and not, not when it was a glint in someone's eye, uh, but not long afterwards. And I, I've seen how FSC members really came together to create and develop and further develop uh, this common code. Um, so that's my role here today. Um, on the issue of what I think a code is, well, well, I think quite simply a code is a set of common expectations. Um, it's, it's a guide for people to act in a consistent way to do the right thing. And, and I'm very focused on this being for people and for organisations, for, for people and for individuals within organisations, because organisations are made up of people and it's the way the people behave that drives the outcomes. So a code helps all those people working together um, have a common view of those expectations on behaviour. Um, but the other thing for me and a bit of an insight, and I'm sure we'll get on to it more, is it's, it's all very well having a written set of expectations. And I hear absolutely what others have said about values and about accountability. Uh, but, but for me, I think the, one of the, the key things is helping people understand why it's important to have that common set of expectations. So getting the why question answered, first of all, and then helping people and working with people to understand how we can embed uh, any change behaviour, how we can do things differently if we need to do things differently, either at an individual level or at a process level or at an organisation level. Um, so, so for me, it's great to have, it's a bit like that old saying, you know, a plan only lasts until the first engagement. That's my interpretation of the saying, not the real saying. Um, but, you know, so a code is, is great, but we can't just have it put in a drawer somewhere. It's about making it live. It's about making it real. Um, so, so that's my two pence worth or two cents worth. Um, and back to you, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. And Graeme, last word to you on this introduction. Uh, so thank you for joining. Um, you, you, I think you're, you spend your professional life 
working and helping boards. And so there, it feels like there's a really strong governance connect here between how boards and exec teams think about their roles in terms of how, and then codes become the how you might change and set behaviour. But tell us your story and, and your take on this particular topic. Thanks, Richard, and kia ora tato. Uh, I came to uh, an interest in governance through a succession of chief executive and other senior executive roles back in the well, late 80s into the 1990s. Um, and I got increasingly curious about why boards weren't more effective. <laughs> and, and 25 years ago, approximately now, a colleague and I set up uh, a consultancy to specialise in working with boards called BoardWorks. Um, I've recently stepped down from the active leadership of that company, and my title now is practice leader, which gives me license to do the, uh, a bunch of things, including thinking a bit more about some of these, these things that we talked about today, uh, and hopefully uh, writing about them a bit as well. But uh, one of the things that is pretty obvious to me, if answering the, the question about codes, is that uh, over that period of 25 years or so uh, and, and more that I've been on boards as well, uh, the thing that's different today from, from when I first started is that the organisational culture and values, which used to be the province of management, is now clearly sheeted home uh, to the boards. And that's been reinforced really quite strongly uh, recently with, for example, the Australian Royal Commission, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in, in a moment. But for me, codes are absolutely central to good governance of organisations and governance in the broadest sense, not just in terms of what the, the board's job is. Uh, and as others have said, you know, values and behaviours are, are very central uh, to that. To me, it, it's, it's about alignment, uh, which, which others have referred to. It's it, the process of developing a code is almost as important as what results uh, from, from that process. Uh, and so that's an alignment issue. But once the code's complete, you've really got a basis for assurance uh, of all those, those stakeholder groups that, that uh, uh, Jeff referred to before. Um, and in particular, I think uh, at the customer end, it's very interesting to look back over uh, some of the uh, uh, reporting that was done by the Australian Royal Commission um, they, they came up with six desirable behaviours. Um, obey the law, do not uh, mislead or deceive, be fair, provide services that are fit for purpose, uh, deliver services with reasonable care and skill, and when acting for another, act in the best interests of that other. And those all go to the heart of the interests of, of consumers, customers in particular, but also those other stakeholder groups as well. Um, so I, I think it's it's um, it's absolutely central uh, to, to to good governance and professionalism uh, and ethical behaviour. Graham, do you think, just picking up that point, you know, have codes always been around? Um, have we or have we always just known that what the right thing to do is, and and businesses have kind of done the right thing, or do you think there's kind of been a change? and a higher set of expectations that have kind of taken all of us into, into these conversations. Yes, look, I, I think that's true. I, I think probably you could go back a, a reasonable uh, distance to uh, corporate governance in its early uh, formal forms, uh, but, but that doesn't go back that far either. It really just goes back in a modern sense to the 1987 share market crash, and there was a lot of interest subsequent to that and. Uh, really an attempt at that stage to professionalise uh, governance, uh, board roles, directorships. We had a whole raft of legislation that followed all around the world, New Zealand Companies Act 1993, for example. Um, and then what's followed on from that are, are codes which have been promoted by the regulatory authorities, uh, you know, the various stock exchange uh, organisations like the ASX, NZX, uh, and, and other regulators like the FMA. Um, and indeed now, the you know, latest cab off the rank, in a sense, is, is the FSC. And I particularly like what, what you guys came up with because it's got two dimensions to it. It, it has the behavioural element, uh, you know, that part one, ethical behaviour, conduct and client care, but it's also got a competency element. Uh, and I think, you know, what we've seen over the last 20 years or so is a huge increase in governance training, which 
I don't think probably has gone as far as some of the more mechanical or structural elements of governance into the behavioural stuff. But that's coming now, as I say, because uh, boards are now expected to, to step up and take responsibility for corporate culture and the behaviour that flows from that corporate culture. Thanks, Graham. Heidi, I'm going to go to you because I think, you know, there's a, there's three questions that have come up through this introduction, you know, the why, how and what's of codes. And Graham's point around, you know, it's the creation of the code as much as the code itself that become important. I wonder if you can kind of observe, you know, how, how tough was it, how difficult was the struggle to land a code where you're actually dealing with so many disparate uh, and, and, and sometimes competing forces and views to get to a point that everyone says, yes, it is both meaningful on the one hand, but uh, I can sign on to it on the other. Yeah, great. Thank you for that question, Richard. And yeah, I actually wrote down, Graham, what you said there about the journey being of creating being as important. Um, look, it wasn't easy. It is probably an understatement of the year. Uh, the FSC membership started on the journey five years ago to create the code. And the code became effective, the FSC Code of Conduct became effective January 2019, was signed off in the middle of 2018. So what you can tell by that is it's been a long process. Um, and, and that length of time was needed for a number of different things. Um, Richard, you asked about the challenges there. Um, so the challenges, absolutely to your point, different business models, different size and scale, different industries, different legislation covering different parts of the FSC membership, a changing regulatory landscape. You know, at the beginning of the journey, um, Graham, you mentioned the Australian Royal Commission. Well, that was forefront in everybody's mind at the beginning of the journey. Um, and a bit to the uh, the comments that you made earlier, Angus, you know, the, the financial advice code was, was only just being created at that point in time as well. So it was a real moving feast. So trying to create the FSC code of conduct within that realm of greyness and ambiguity was definitely one of the challenges. Um, but the, um, look, the, the fantastic thing was the people. And I've said it already, but the people that were involved um, in creating the FSC code of conduct, this wasn't a single person. Uh, this was people from within FSC member organisations coming together having the hard conversations and agreeing what we couldn't cover because deciding what to leave out was just as important as deciding what to have in. So there are some things that we just couldn't cover. Uh, you know, the Commerce Commission means we can't cover things that talk about pricing or restriction of competition. So there are things that we had to leave out. But otherwise, you know, it might have been good to include, but we couldn't. Um, so the reason that the FSC code is principles based is because um, the FSC membership felt that that would make the most difference. It would also be able to be accepted and embedded by a broad range of organisations. Um, and it would give guidance without giving prescription. And I think that's probably the, the, the key um, for me over that journey. But to ask quite simply, Richard, the challenges were people, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the highlights were people. Um, and, and particularly, if I can, I'll, I'll shout out to the, everyone that's been involved in the, the code, the FSC code committees over the period of time, uh, the code governance committee, the code working group. Boy, um, the people there are passionate, enthusiastic, and have rolled their sleeves up. Um, and, and that's why we've got what we have. Thanks, Heidi. Angus, I'm going to ask you much the same question because your constituents, uh, whilst we might have had 50 or 60 organisations in the tent, in the financial advice community, there are thousands um, that the code kind of has to bind together in a sense. What, what were some of the, if you can reflect on that, how, how what, what and why as the financial advice committee developed the code? Well, I suppose two responses. Firstly, to endorse the comment about process. Um, you know, codes are all actually about bringing people together to a common sense uh, set of values. And uh, I think that that's one of the things that distinguishes them from legislation that is imposed. It's, it's this ability to um, perhaps not settle, but at least move towards a view that people are happy with. But I mean, the other, the other aspect about codes is the flexibility. And that sort of brings me to the second point, which is your why, what, and how. 
because the why ties very closely with the evolving social contract, you know, particularly over the last 25 years, what is expected of people, be they financial advisors or financial services businesses, is very, very different. There's, you know, much more an attitude of um, uh, industry, you need to be able to do it, or corporates, you need to be able to do it rather than be told how to do it. And some of the stuff that um, advisors or businesses are expected to do is very difficult to pin down in precise terms. So if you've got the, the why of the, this changing social contract, which will continue to change, and you know, sort of park there that, that thought that codes need to be able to evolve into the, the what, and in, the, in this, the sense of the financial advice code, the what is simply treat clients fairly. And it sounds, you know, it doesn't sound too complicated, but then when you dig into that, there are lots of aspects to it and the, and the how, the actual standards within the code where the precision starts to come in, albeit still at a principles level, um, is, is the, the things you need to do um, in order to achieve that, that, that what. And so those three things, the, the why, what, and how all sort of tie together um, to hopefully get you to a useful place. And just Thanks, to Angus. touch on that, Angus, um, that comment about the social contract, I think is a really good one because that social license is now more important than ever. Yeah. Um, it's that, you know, the acceptance granted to any industry or organisation to by the community, um, it's completely built on trust and confidence. And the code, our codes of conduct, of course, go to the heart of that social license. Uh, one of the key pillars, of course, of the FSC and, of course, the FMA as well is to enhance the public's trust and confidence in our industry. Um, so I think our, our social license to operate as financial institutions is um, intrinsically linked to that trust and confidence and thereby to our codes. Jeff, can I, can I throw that one in as you as well? We were talking yesterday about the social licence point, but, but I, I wondered if you could also perhaps comment on, you know, are there, are there ever times where the various stakeholder groups that you mentioned kind of run into conflict with each other that the code, codes find difficult to resolve? Um, perhaps throw those couple of uh, thoughts at you if I can. Um, well, taking the first point, Richard, uh, I, I agree with Amy's comment that um, you know, the concept of the social license to conduct business, to practice a profession, has never been stronger. There was a time, you know, some years ago, some of us can remember it um, uh, even now, there was a time where those sorts of things weren't really part of the conversation. Uh, that you simply got on with business and the role of business was just to make money. Um, there was no real uh, concentration, if you will, on, on the how that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but the idea of uh, any uh, undertaking being part of a social fabric, part of a community, has become so uh, entrenched, I think, as to be trite. Um, and the idea of an expression of values through code of conduct or uh, code of practice uh, is now part and parcel of the messaging that goes to those who grant the social contract or the social license, uh, which is the consuming public at large, the message to them that says, you know, we are deserving of your trust, we are deserving of your consent to operate, uh, because that can be lost so, so very quickly, as we've seen in many, many instances. So my view uh, is that the, um, uh, the, the code process and with that the disciplinary process that I've been asked to uh, um, contribute to is all part of cementing that very important uh, social contract, social license, um, which is now um, you know, a key part of the way business uh, has to be conducted. The second point you asked, Richard, was whether uh, you see in relation to uh, code uh, expressions and, and code discipline uh, points of potential conflict. And obviously you, you do. If, if I deal with the disciplinary side 
Um, it, it is clear that uh, when an issue of potential uh, moment in terms of an alleged breach of a code uh, or alleged bad behaviour uh, emerges, you're going to have different views of, of that uh, abroad between the different constituencies that I've referred to. It seems to me that that's part and parcel of the fact that um, a code of uh, conduct uh, is an expression that is heard in different ways by different constituencies. It exists to provide the benefits that I talked about earlier to those constituencies. But inevitably, it's not going to mean precisely the same thing to every one of those constituencies. And I see the role of uh, the disciplinary committee that uh, I'm a member of uh, as trying to sort out where you land uh, for uh, those various constituencies when you consider the competing views of behaviour. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to just pick up that consumer uh, piece that uh, that's really implied in the social licence discussion. Amy, I might go to you first and then, Graeme, to you for a boardroom perspective. Amy, within, within the organisation, within AAA, which is obviously a, a large kind of global organisation, how does, how does the code conversation impact uh, the customer conversation? You know, how, how, how does it live and breathe in the way you induct people or the way you kind of communicate, communicate to clients and so on? Yeah, so I think, um, as Heidi mentioned, the important thing about a code is actually how um, is actually making sure that people understand what it's about. So it's it's no good that we have a perfect code and that it's uh, locked away in a, in a bottom drawer somewhere. So it really is about um, about the people and about bringing it to life and making sure that it really is embedded in a in a meaningful way or a real way throughout the organisation. Um, at AIA being New Zealand's largest life insurer, um, we are very committed to our purpose of, of making a difference in Kiwi's lives. And we see that um, through, you know, through our kind of tone from the top in terms of our board and our senior leadership living and breathing that every day. And I think at a practical level, some of the things that um, I think we've invested time in to ensure that our people truly do understand what the code means and what it means for them is by, you know, ensuring that it's it's available on our intranet um, in, a, in a really easy to find place, um, discussing the code at team meetings, discussing those principles, requiring all staff um, to complete annual learning modules around the code. Um, and same sort of things apply as well in terms of the practical um, tools that you can use to really embed things like the, the FSC code of conduct as well um, for all of the FSC members. And just making sure that um, the way that those conversations are being had around the code and those principles are filled with practical examples that make it a little bit more relatable um, and really just bring it to life, I guess. Um, and that's that's how we, as a large organisation um, across lots of different markets, are able to um, really embed those principles in a in a real way through um, through all of our processes and and things that we that we're doing at AIA. Thanks, so, because you're right. I mean, when you when you take across a span of a small or large or medium sized organisation, it's it's much more about what you do because it's the doing that creates the learning and then the behavioural change to. Back to Hades' point, given it's about the people, uh, and so Graham, I might I might hand to you on this one. Um, how do boards how do boards kind of measure and make sure that they're getting the flow of information so that the direction that's been set is is flowing? And, and the flip on that is, and what happens? You know, how how do boards manage when when things don't go right? Now that's a very broad question or set of questions. Uh, I, I I'd start from the uh, situation that a code, code of conduct, code of ethics, or a, a, a generic industry-wide code is, is sort of a performance management tool uh, from the board level down through senior management. And I, I think what we've seen um, in a number of uh, the sort of uh, corporate meltdowns that have occurred as a result of, of poor culture and that sort of thing is that, you know, that there's plenty of talk 
um, and, and a ritual salute to corporate values and those sorts of things at a senior level. But actually, um, that, that talk doesn't get walked. And, and boards in the past and senior management teams even have not done nearly enough to, to ensure that the behaviours that indeed they were incentivising through remuneration structures and, and in other ways were actually playing out at middle management and, and at the customer interface. Um, again, I'd re revert back to the uh, Australian Royal Commission, which really exposed that huge gap um, and what it's shown and what many other corporate situations have shown is, is that really uh, so-called uh, values, the corporate values that, that are intended to set the tone at the top, um, have really been what one of my colleagues calls bumper sticker values. I mean, they're just rhetorical flourishes rather than anything which has real impact on the way things get done and the way people think about the way they engage with their customers uh, and with other stakeholders too, for that matter. Um, so, it, so I think it is now being used in that performance management tool way that there's now increasing attempts to, to, to have information flowing up uh, from, from the grassroots of an organisation. Uh, in New Zealand, we're still very weak when it comes to things like whistleblower uh, provisions and those sorts of avenues, I think many organisations are still feeling their way as to how they can really get a grip on what, what is the real culture in practice? What are the values in practice right through an organisation? Um, and there was just a publication just came out from the IOD just in the last few weeks. Uh, there's been a review done of the, N N the NZX top 50 companies and really, there's only about a third of them that really match up in terms of actually implementing the sort of things that, that we're talking about. Um, just before I finish, too, I'd just like to add that we're talking very much about these formal industry-wide or, or even um, you know, uh, cross-industry uh, codes like uh, the FMA, uh, NZX, FC, FSC codes there's another really important level of code making, and that's at the board or the organization specific level. It often takes the form of a board charter, for example, which will contain things like code of behavior or code of ethics. Uh, and those are really important documents and codes in the non-commercial sector, right? Uh, and, and many of our, our organizations are what is often these days called for purpose organizations. I think we tend to assume that because they are set up to do good work, then their behaviour is good as well, but we can't make that assumption. So those internal, those, those intra-corporate codes are very important as well. Thanks, Graeme. That, that kind of connect between remuneration and focus and tone from the top becomes pretty important in the implementation piece. Um, there's been a couple of really great questions here about code enforcement, and we spoke earlier on around, um, you know, how do you make sure a code's got teeth? Um, Jeff, I might go to you first and then Angus second. Um, pro probably the question is, like, how do we know? Uh, how do we know when things go wrong? And, and then what? how do you give the market confidence that a code is actually working to plan because there's a robust process and a robust but fair um, uh, disciplinary uh, process that goes through to, you know, to, to, to really sit, sit in judgment or sit in assessment? Um, I suppose, Richard, the starting point is that um, I inevitably uh, there's a kind of period where you just have to suck it and see because until you get um, down the process so that people can see that there's an appropriate response to the suggestion of a breach of the code and, and that that is not just lip service. Um, you're not necessarily going to have confidence at all of those stakeholder levels. Um, it, it is going to take time and it is going to take experience. Um, it's going to take examples uh, uh, in the best sense of the word, um, uh, for people to see that the code is honoured uh, in its expression and operation uh, in the right uh, in the right sense. So I think it, it's a, uh, and this is what we're seeing. I think as we develop 
the FSC procedures, it, it's, um, it, it's clear that uh, both the organisations that are members of FS, uh, FSC want and need to see that the process that will give the code teeth, for want of a better description, are robust, can be relied upon, but are equally fair and transparent so that everyone uh, understands that uh, it, you know, it, there's going to be a fair uh, shake given to anyone who comes within that uh, disciplinary regime. I think um, the FSC has, uh, in the way in which it's mapped out the way forward for the disciplinary side of things, uh, tried to ensure that um, th this is a process that is really going to bite where it counts by ensuring that the disciplinary committee, for example, doesn't look at minutiae. We're looking for and looking to deal with matters that are material breaches of the code that therefore, by their nature, have real significance to the constituencies that I talked about earlier on. Um, but on the, on the first question, how, you know, how do you... Uh, engender the confidence that, uh, that you've talked about. I think it is out of walking the walk. It's actually you know, doing the job that has to be done to identify those breaches, call them out, and deal with them robustly but fairly. Thanks, Jeff. There's, there's a piece there as well, and it's more uh, an in FSC discussion, just around the structure and reporting lines, isn't it? Because there's been lots of examples in the public domain um, when things have gone wrong and, and organisations or industry bodies or sporting bodies might take on and say, look, we've set up a committee to investigate and we'll come back to you. And, and it's almost like the organisation then sets up its own system for its own purposes. And that kind of sense of trust and confidence and separateness in many ways actually engender the strength of the process rather than, um, you know, we'll try and try and manage it through and try and get over this particular crisis. In, in general, are there any kind of observations on that, less about the FSC, but just more, more about the public confidence piece? Uh, well, uh, for, for my part, I think the, the real element of, um, uh, of uh, uh, import in what you've just touched on is the need for independence and transparency. Um, the, the risk in these processes is that the organisation um, who's uh, seen or thought to have gone off the rails or whose members may have done so um, is too close to the uh, disciplinary process. There's a, there's a need for independence, a need for transparency. That separatism that you talked about um, it is fundamental to ensuring that people look at the process and say, yes, we can rely on the outcome as not being manipulated by parties who have an interest in that. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Angus, I'll go to you on that same question and then maybe, Graham, just an observation from you with that kind of board perspective. Uh, Angus. Yeah, so I suppose in my mind you've got to think of it at both a micro and a macro level. At the macro level, it's... Um, helping to create a code where you've got sufficient hooks in the code for it to actually be useful when it comes to the crunch. And um, I mean, we relied really heavily on the input that we got through the consultation process and hearing people speak about what worked and didn't, didn't work in terms of what good advice looked like to try and build those hooks. And um, we ended up trying in the code to create a bit of a mesh where it would be difficult to just breach a single standard alone. You would inevitably trip over several st standards at the same time. So there would be little doubt that you weren't complying with the code because you know, you'd have those, those multiple angles. And then sort of reinforcing that with commentary material and the code that, that, that hopefully helped. But when I say that you need to think of it at the macro level as well, Codes themselves are also in the dock, as it were. You can't just sort of put the code up on the mantelpiece and say, this is perfect and this works well, and if anybody doesn't follow it, then they get pinged. The code itself needs to be tested routinely. I'm not saying 
every month, but you know, at reasonable periods, it needs to be assessed about as to whether it's doing its job right, as to whether the aggregate macro effect of that code in whatever workplace or profession or whatever uh, the code sit, uh, sits over, that it's actually um, resulting in the outcomes, those high level outcomes that people want. So judging a code is, is not just about judging how it's applied at the micro level to each individual case. It's also whether the cumulative effect of that code being put into practice has actually led to good outcomes. Thanks, Angus. Great. Yeah, uh, look, I, I think I would make a distinction between codes that apply to uh, professional practice, if you like, organisations that can control the entry of, of practitioners to and, and control their livelihoods to some degree. Those disciplinary processes are potentially very powerful sanctions but there are a lot of other environments where there is no sanction in quite the same disciplinary sense. But I, I think that we're seeing in that environment, that other environment, that things like social media and, and other social practices, the social license issues that are now coming to the fore, actually go right to the heart of organizational reputation with their customers, both actual and potential. And so there's another form of discipline, a market discipline, if you like, going on as there is better, greater transparency, more understanding that those codes exist and that, uh, in fact, I mean, what we're saying at the board level now is increasing attention paid to measures, call them KPIs or, or what have you, but measures of um, things like net promoter scores. You know, is, is a customer likely to recommend that, that somebody they know would do business with the same organization because of the, you know, they were treated properly and, and have trust and confidence in the products or services. So I think there's an awful lot going on out there which is revolving around the catalyst of, of, of various codes, but actually is part of wider social movements as well. Thanks, yeah, Craig. Sorry, Amy, you go. Oh, sorry, Richard. Um, just to touch on, yeah, that, um, Graham, in terms of customers, I guess, that natural gravitation um, to organisations or, or industries where the values align, right, with their own personal values and, and especially where they see that those organisations or um, industries are actually taking those values seriously. But also on, on your point about the, um, the difference between codes, um, depending on if it's an, a professional organisation or, or something else, I mean, you see that play out at the moment in the media about a lot of these um, codes of conduct for fans, for, foot, uh, for football, for example, or for, um, yeah, for different, uh, different clubs, especially the Premier League, which um, have got obviously big problems with hooliganism. Um, but when you don't have that control over um, the, the members, it's, it's even more difficult. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, to also just touch on the fact that at the moment there, in, in terms of that sporting piece, there's uh, a couple of really good Netflix series at the moment. Uh, we're all very, very um, mindful of the Netflix at the moment, of course, with Auckland's not lockdown, um, and a couple of those ones are Bad Sport and Untold, and both of those uh, really kind of drill into that culture of sport um, and how it can actually be changed. And I think the, the one thing that kind of comes through very clearly is that um, the importance of codes of conduct in those types of environments um, is all about being able to drive that cultural change. So you see it across all sorts of different um, aspects of life, which is quite interesting. Which is awesome. Thank you, Amy. I was going to stay with you if I can, because... You know, if uh, if sport is a metaphor for life, if you're a sporting fan and, and I'm a sporting fan, you know, you kind of see the best and the worst in many ways. Um, so the, the role of codes to kind of lift standards, become aspirational. I mean, what, 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 what's your sense on that and, and have you seen that play out in maybe some of the examples in your own life? Yeah, um, I, I think by showing your customers that you aren't just complying with the law, with those minimum standards, that you're actually voluntarily putting yourself out there and saying, hey, look, we're going above and beyond because we're staying true to our commitment to quality and to doing what's right. Um, that's where you build trust and you build trust in your brand, 
um, or your your organisation, whatever that might be. And so you know you, you see that in all in all areas, especially um, it's it's kind of already becomes more prevalent when it's splashed across the front pages. But um, at the moment, as um, I, you know, my mind goes to those. Uh, you know, there's terrible and very serious allegations of um, harassment and sexism within the Australian Parliament this year. Um, and one of the the big, the key aspects of that review that came out of that in terms of the culture um, of politics um, generally in Australia was that there is no code of conduct. Um, so one of the things that is actually going through Australian Parliament at the moment is um, a draft code of conduct, looking at just these issues and obviously just recognising the important um, tool that a code of conduct can or is in terms of actually driving that change. That's great. Thanks, Amy. And, and Hayley, um, just mindful folks of uh, time and it always races from us, but Hayley, just to you on, I mean, you've been front row seat in terms of how the FSC code is manifested in terms of lifting outcomes and, and getting us to collectively think about fairly challenging questions. I mean, what, what's your sense of the lifting standards conversation and, and how, in this case, the FSC code may have done that? Yeah, that, that's a, a brilliant question. It's a work in progress, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the FSC membership uh, base is about 98, 98, 98, 99 members across a range of different industries from funds management, restricted schemes, life, health insurers, and all the supporting organisations that go along with that. So it's a very diverse mix. And you've got some, some young entrepreneurial organisations um, and you've got some older, more established organisations. And change is hard in any organisation, but the different types of organisation have a different challenges in, in embedding that change. So in terms of making a difference or um, a driving change because of the FSC Code of Conduct, I can think of a couple of examples where I've actually seen tangible change. I've seen um, a couple of FSC members, and I'm not going to name names because that's, that's not fair, um, but take the FSC Code of Conduct seriously. Um, you know, so, so embed it in their organisations through things like learning modules, through their leaders walking the talk, through their board having a discussion about it, through the code being talked about um, in team meetings. So I've seen that happen. Have I seen that happen in all of the 98 or 99 members? Absolutely not. And I'd be a fool to expect that to, to happen. Um, so I think it's slowly, slowly, Richard, is probably my, uh, my take on that. Um, I think that as an industry, a broad industry, financial service industry, we've got a ways to go. Um, but we're on the journey and we've started. And, and that's probably the most important thing um, from my perspective. Thanks, Heidi. And that's probably a great segue into a closing comment from everyone, which is codes and the future. You know, what does it look like? Um, how important will they become? And, um, and then we'll uh, introduce Sean to, to close us out. We might go in reverse order for this one. Graeme, uh, perhaps if we start with you. Thanks, Richard. Look, as I've listened to what others have said, um, I have a sort of sense of an evolving situation, and Heidi was really just hinting at it, um, I, I think that, if nothing else, what these various codes are doing is raising awareness. But I think the awareness is increasing more rapidly than, than we've got the tools to implement. And, and I think that's where there's still uh, room for a lot of innovation and a lot more, more development. And, and it will probably take a few, um, if I can call them, ritual hangings as well, perhaps in the disciplinary sense, uh, in order to really bring some boards and some senior management teams to the table. And I've seen that happening. We do quite a bit of work in the high-performance sport area, and there's been a number of uh, situations over the last you know, year or two uh, where, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, there have been quite serious issues in terms of the treatment of professional athletes uh, and in other organisations too, more staff care going on. So all those constituencies that, that were referred to earlier, I think are starting to benefit from the increasing awareness, but there's, there's still room for a lot more development. Thanks, Graeme. Uh, Angus. 
Yeah, well, first of all, it's been a fantastic discussion having all this, this interplay. And I, I mean, what's really solidified in my head just listening to people is, you know, codes are all about values. And, you know, a lot of what we've done in financial services is a value around the customer, the client, but there are other values as well, um, climate for example, and, and so forth. And it's this process of yeah, getting greater diversity in our thinking about values and using codes to drive the thinking uh, about that. So, yeah, it, you know, in, in, if there is one thing about the future of codes, it has to be they can't be static. They, they need to evolve. They need to respond to what is important to operating an effective business. Thanks, Angus. Heidi? Yeah, I'm going to pick up on the evolution point there, Angus, because because from my mind, that's absolutely on the money. Um, so for a tangible example, the FSC code of conduct has been in place for three years. What's the future for the FSC code? Well, we're doing its first review. So there's a six-month process reaching out for feedback from a whole range of stakeholders, constituents, Graham, um, to your comment at the, in the opening, um, because we want to know, has it made a difference? Um, and so that's what we'll be asking over the next six months. So that's the future for the FSC code. Thanks, Heidi. Jeff? Um, Richard, I can really only echo what has already been said. I've, I've never seen this as a static process, and that's reinforced by the fact that uh, you know, it has taken two and a half years to work through the uh, process of you know, d developing the way a disciplinary committee should operate um, at the risk of being the person who might be asked to deliver the ritual hangings that were referred to earlier. Um, I do see it as important that the disciplinary side of things uh, gets underway so that um, all of those five constituents that I referred to earlier see that there is a complete, a rounded process that is something more than just uh, lip service to principle. Um, so I, I look forward to the process continuing. Um, uh, I'm absolutely sure that that is something that will be refreshed and renewed regularly, simply because the society in which member organisations are operating is changing very, very quickly. Thank you, Jeff. And Amy, last word to you. Yeah, I guess as an industry, our um, customers are why we're here. Um, customer expectations are continually changing as they should be. Um, this is a journey, as we've all um, mentioned, and I think just one that we need to buckle, buckle on in for, and it's, um, it's going to be a good one. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I'm going to introduce Sean uh, McDonald in just a moment, but uh, from my part, a huge thank you to all the panellists. I, I reflect on two messages, one about three years ago, uh, sitting with uh, Liam and a number of senior FMA uh, uh, people who said, look, if you're going to have a code, it's got to have teeth. And that piece that Graham raised, which is in it, has to be tested. And to Jeff's point as well, that, you know, it's it's often in the bad examples that people really set up and listen and then take a pretty stern action. And within the cult conduct and culture conversation and the Australian Royal Commission conversation, we've kind of seen stuff writ large uh, that are pointers to what to do, but also what not to do. And so thank you to the panel. On that note, uh, Sean um, is there. A big welcome to Sean McDonald from Board Pro to thank the speakers, uh, wrap us and close us out. Over to you, Sean, and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Richard. It was uh, great uh, listening to the discussion over the last 45-odd minutes. For those of you who don't know, uh, Board Pro, we're a board software provider that serve around 13,000 users around the world, and we effectively enable organisations to run their board meetings uh, more effectively with less time and deliver uh, more value and impact to the organisation. So um, as much as we are a software provider, part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy to implement for all organisations, especially those with uh, resource constraints. So uh, we're really proud to be a sponsor of uh, FSC this particular session. It was uh, great uh, being, being along today listening to the discussion. Thanks, panellists. And on that note, to everyone watching, thanks for joining. And uh, we will see you at the next uh, event, which is coming up uh, on Friday, 
um, and um, look out for comms from the FSC on that one. Uh, this has been recorded, so will be available. We are on the record. There were a number of journos on the other end of the line, so we look forward to, to reading the great debate. Um, and um, uh, as ever, appreciate uh, everyone's engagement. Uh, thanks and have a fantastic afternoon. Kia ora.